participants? We have we have 19 people so far, so maybe we'll wait another two, three minutes and then we'll begin. Yeah, I think so. I think so. It is uh it is 7 p.m. sharp. So let's let's uh wait another two, three minutes. <laughs> people are probably still yeah, maybe not even started supper yet. Let me just practice sharing my slides. You, you all have a slightly different setup than I am accustomed to, so let me make sure that I can do it. Mm -hmm. oh, good thing I tried. Okay. Yes, yeah. that works. That works. Right, right. Sharing wrong slide, but in any case, I've got the I've got the technology mastered. I think. Okay. There we go. Right slide. Okay. Okay. Stop share. Great. Are, are we inviting has everyone been invited or only the academy members to this to this meeting no no we uh we send it over i think very widely right malka but yes know, we actually have almost 200 people signed up but people yeah. are not everyone is going to come and, and i guess some people are taking their time but uh, so this is the inverse of the usual israeli pattern which is no one signs up and everybody shows up <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know it, it, whether it's the hour 7 p.m. You I'm know, sure some people yeah. are stuck in traffic going back, especially on Thursday. So if they are on the way from the office, you know, to home, right. they might be stuck there. It's it's the hour. It's the fact that people have children at home. But and, but and, and it's quarter. Thursday. And I appreciate not having to do this at 6 a.m. Believe me. No. We have also, Mary Claire, we have as well as Israelis, we have some Europeans as well, just so you should be aware. Oh, marvelous. Right. Fantastic. Yeah. From where? Yeah. From which countries? Oh, I don't rem remember exactly. Uh, I believe from France, from Slovenia. Oh, yeah. From Spain, I know we have one. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Me <laughs> finally, finally, some other languages I can speak. <laughs> Okay, people are starting to join. Yes. So I'll give it another minute. Oh, Hagit, how nice to see you. It's lovely to see you. We have not seen each other forever. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Very well. It's good to see you. We are honored that, uh, to hear you. Oh, well, I am honored to speak to you. What can I say? Besides, one <laughs> never says no to a fraud, as you know very well. <laughs> I think you have so many friends in Israel. You probably should just move here. <laughs> you know, I probably would if it weren't for the language. I mean, as an old person, to I, I have no absolutely no Hebrew. I, I took one pass at learning it 20 years ago. It's very difficult if you have absolutely no background. There are so many people in Israel who have no clue how to speak Hebrew and manage very well. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't manage well at the level that I need to manage well, right? I mean, they to embed yourself in your country, you you need to know the language of the country. It's only reasonable. Well, my uh, former mother-in-law never uh, actually mastered it, so. <laughs> really? What, what was her first language? Um, English, she's from English. Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, being in Israel, everybody speaks English. Everybody's happy to speak English to you. Right. Well, that's true in your world. It's, it's less true than you might, it's less true now than it was in the 90s when I started coming. Really? Yes, There's there are, yeah, I think it's both immigrant populations who have never learned English, and there's no reason they should have. And um, 
lots of young Israelis, not the ones who end up in science labs, but lots of young Israelis, um, it's, they speak it less, much, much less fluently than they think. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an interesting evolution. It's both, I mean, I think it's both a source of pride in that Hebrew is obviously a, a, a living, vibrant language and one can do anything in it. Um, but it's a frustration for somebody coming from Seattle, Washington. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Or would you like, Rivka, would you like to start? At 7.05, we have about uh, 30 people. Yeah, I think we're good. Five minutes. So, Aura, would All you right. So I think that uh, Rivka is going to start. Rivka's starting, okay. All right, so good evening, big member of the Israeli National Academy um, of Sciences in Medicine by the Israeli Medical Association. And I welcome all the other participants, our friends from Europe, and uh, from Israel as well, I recognize some names that are not members of the Academy, but still very welcome. Uh, good evening to you, our Professor uh, Frat Levi Lahat, Vice President of the Academy. And good morning to you, dear colleague and friend, the renowned and esteemed Marie Claire King. So wonderful to have you here with us. I'm really utterly delighted. Uh, to open this uh, second academy webinar this year and this time, remember the last one was last year, but this time as we are in Israeli, uh, very well vaccinated and almost back to normal. As of June 1st, Marie Claire will be like 99% normal in Israel. Uh, as you know, we had also the good luck of having the webinar scheduled um, to the date where we are also past this military experience, uh, which was really devastating. So what can I say? It is a good time to sit back and enjoy excellent science. Because after all, this is our mission here at the Academy. Uh, we would like to promote high quality, basic and clinical research done by practicing physicians uh, as we strongly believe that this kind of bedside scientists, we think we, they bring unique perception and also a one in a kind angle into life sciences, exact sciences, and in, even engineering sciences um, as it relates to the human body, to medicine and health. Uh, however, when it comes to cooperation between physician scientists and academic research and scientists, as in the case of Efrat and yourself, Marie Claire, I think breaks rules is even bigger and the potential is huge. So you've, you've shown us over the year what is kind of this collaboration can really yield wonderful things. And I, I'm looking forward to hear some of them in your presentations. So it is good to have you here, albeit uh, virtually. I, I understand that we'll, there is a chance that We'll see you in half a year in person, which would be, you know, I'm going to sign you on another, I don't think, webinar, but obviously something with the Academy. So uh, let's start this duo webinar. This is the, the term I coined, duo webinar. And I would like to call now upon our Professor Ora Pantiel. Uh, Aura is a hematologist, oncologist. hematologist She's a member of the academy. Uh, she's also a very known uh, uh, epidemiologist. Uh, and she's going to introduce the speakers and also moderate uh, the whole event. So thank you very much, Aura. It is your stage. Thank you very much, Rivka. Well, I'm, I'm very excited to uh, chair this, this uh, webinar and the theme of the webinar tonight or this morning is genetic analysis of inherited breast and ovarian cancer from gene discovery to precision medicine and public health. And before I introduce our speakers individually, um, I think I have to introduce them collectively because one of the things that I've admired so much about this duo is their friendship, their loyalty to one another. Um, the fact that science brought about friendship and friendship brought about science and it continues for years and years and years to be fruitful and, um, and collaborative 
and to, and to the benefit of mankind. So I think it's a very, very special relationship that we're seeing tonight and not just um, special contribution uh, to science. So I'd like to introduce um, Professor Mary Claire King. It's really an honor to introduce you, Mary Claire. Mary Claire is a geneticist and American Cancer Society Professor of Medicine and Genome Science at the University of Washington in Seattle. She was the first to prove that breast cancer is inherited in some families as a result of mutations in the gene that she named BRCA1. In addition to inherited breast and ovarian cancer, her interests include the genetic basis of severe mental illness and in partnership with Israeli and Palestinian colleagues, gene discovery for hearing loss and other inherited disorders of childhood. Mary Claire, we're looking forward to your talk, which will be about between 25 minutes and half an hour, something like that. Shall I, shall I begin before you introduce Efrat? Yes, please oh, do. Okay, let me share my screen. Here we go. Well, it, it's a tremendous honor for me to, to, to join you today. It, uh, congratulations on the establishment of the Israel National Academy of Science and Medicine. I hope very much that we can establish an affiliation between your academy and the National Academy of Medicine in the US. We have, of course, such an affiliation between the National Academy of Sciences in the US and the Israeli um, uh, Academy of, of Science and Humanities, and it would be lovely to establish another one as well. Uh, your, your comment about the partnership with Efrat is, is absolutely well taken. It reminds me of a comment by Ruth Arnon um, fairly early on in my visits to Israel, which began now more than 25 years ago. And we were having supper with some, some colleagues that at the time I didn't yet know well. And uh, one of them said to me, so that I was talking about the partnership with, with Efrat, and the colleague said, do you come for the friendship or do you come for the science? And before I could answer, Ruti said, she came originally for the science and she stayed for both. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really true. It's, it's been one of, the, one of the great relationships, both personal and scientific, of my life. My, my assignment today is to give you some background, some personal history. It will be a bit of a memoir about the genetics of inherited breast and ovarian cancer and to set the stage in a very general way, that is to tell you what the situation is at present um, in, in the U.S., because of course the level of heterogeneity in the U.S. is extremely high and in many ways echoed by the level of heterogeneity in your region as a whole, and to also tell you a, a bit, I hope I, I hope I have time to get to it, about some technologies that we are just now developing to try to identify mutations of classes that are not picked up by conventional testing. Okay, we'll do this. So we will begin with my favorite slide of, of one of my favorite men. This is Paul Broca, the 19th century French surgeon, neurobiologist, anatomist, and general Renaissance man who among his his many accomplishments described families with inherited breast cancer. He, of course, did not have the concept of the gene. He was working in the 1860s in Paris. Um, he did, we now know, read and appreciate Darwin's work. Um, there is, he was a member, a founder of a society of free thinkers in Paris. He was a, he was a liberal thinking Huguenot in Catholic France, very much my kind of guy. Uh, and among his, among his accomplishments was the description of families in which breast cancer is, as you see, extraordinarily common and occurs in multiple generations. And, and all I've done is convert his paragraphs into pedigree format here. And it, it, as you see, there are some things about this family that really resonate with us today. First, breast cancer is extremely common. It's inherited at quite young ages. It was, of course, without exception, fatal in 19th century France. But then a feature that Broca himself pointed out is particularly interesting. You see here, Broca describes from the autopsy material that he was able to obtain, often, of course, pres preserved, old preserved material, um, cancers in the livers of some of, these, of some of these deceased patients. But Broca wrote, I'm seeing cancers in the liver, but I suspect these are not cancers of the liver. I wonder, he wrote, if these may have invaded from the ovary. Mm. 
So gold star to Broca, he was almost certainly describing inherited breast and ovarian cancer. Um, our friend Dominique Stopalianet has tried to trace these families forward in time to see what their mutations are. And so far, we have not had success because, of course, the names change with every generation, but she has not given up. So at the same time that Broca was working in Paris, Darwin was working in England, Mendel was working in, in Brno, I like to imagine what it would have been like if they had had Zoom, if they had been able to communicate the way that we can. I think if that if they had, we could have skipped the next 130 years of, of not understanding inherited breast cancer because they would have sorted it out on our behalf, but they didn't. So it was left to those of us with much less uh, acuity to try to do our best. So let me do something I almost never do. Let me tell you why this was tough when I undertook it now, um, oh, beginning in the mid-1970s, and show you with this one, what, what shall I say, hand-drawn hand -drawn graph, um, what the critical discovery was. So breast cancer is, of course, extremely common. It varies enormously by geographic region. It is a cancer of well-being, women who are more educated, who are better off, um, who have their children later in life are are more susceptible. A generation ago, there was a tenfold difference in incidence of breast cancer geographically based on those features. Um, and the great majority of breast cancer is not familial in most parts of the world. Obviously, expression is dependent on age and sex. Uh, it was very likely to be heterogeneous, although of course we had no idea before we knew that there were any genes involved. And one could anticipate not only that there would be in principle, many different genes responsible for the inherited component of breast cancer, but that also there could be in the same families both inherited and non-inherited cases. Indeed, the idea that there was a major gene for breast cancer was considered completely bizarre. But it was a great advantage of being a very young woman coming to this field from out of the blue, from mathematical evolutionary biology that I could interact with physicians, most importantly Bernie Fisher on the one hand and Nick Petrakis on the other, who were incredibly generous with their time and with their teaching, and be introduced to families who were severely affected with breast cancer. So I thought, if there is, there's clearly familial clustering of breast cancer. Broca had shown that, it had been shown statistically over and over again by very good epidemiologic work going back to the beginning of the 20th century. And I thought to myself, if there is an inherited a genetically inherited component to this, to this trait, we should be able to prove that it exists and we should be able to prove that it exists by localizing it. A gene is a physical reality. And in the 1970s and 1980s, we didn't, we didn't of course have the entire uh, human genome sequence, but we did have chromosome maps. So a way of proving that a gene existed was by mapping it. In other words, linkage analysis was an epistemological tool. And that's what I decided to try to do. So working with families that, to whom I was introduced by Nick and by Bernie, we undertook linkage analysis. And it was, of course, bird by bird. We worked out one marker at a time, mapped them to the genome with the involvement of the, of the CEF consortium, which was people doing the same thing for various phenotypes all over. Um, a frat was doing was was a few years later plunging into exactly the same kind of analysis for for one form of Alzheimer's disease, and in my case, the the one hundred seventy fourth marker that I worked out and evaluated had the features shown on this on this graph. That is, I was working with a large number of different families, each one represented by a little dot here, and some of which you'll see in just a moment. And each of them had an average age at breast cancer onset, sometimes very young and sometimes more typical. And for each of them, I was able to identify by virtue of having genotypes at each of these markers um, in all of the informative people in the family, so that all the women and sometimes men with breast cancer and all of their <coughs> informative older relatives. I was able to identify the likelihood, literally the likelihood, statistical likelihood, of co-inheritance of my favorite marker with breast cancer versus absence of such evidence. And as we moved along from very young onset families into families with onsets more in middle age, that evidence got better and better with 
the 174th marker. It had been totally useless for the first 173. Then there was a little dip amongst families that were had their average age at onset at age 40. <clears throat> of course, we could not distinguish between a dip due to truly absence of any hypothetical linkage and a dip due to recombination. This one proved to be recombination. Increasing positive evidence again, and then the whole, the whole story just plummeted, completely negative evidence. <clears throat> so I said to myself, perhaps this cumulative score here, these cumulative, cumulative odds in favor of linkage, actually give us a clue that there might be a hypothetical gene on chromosome 17q21 that is physically or that is physically linked to my favorite 174th marker. And the odds were good. The odds were 10 to the 6 to 1 in favor of that hypothesis. Um, I was convinced that this data was real. I only became convinced that it was more than a fluke in the 23 families with which I was working, or actually the subset of them that had young onset breast cancer, when exactly the same result was obtained by Gilbert Lenoir working um, at IARC in Lyon with obviously different families, but with exactly the same markers that I passed to him. So here's where we were in 1990 with linkage analysis. Our data from Berkeley, Gilbert's data from, uh, from Lyon in, in collaboration with Stephen Narod in, in Canada. And there was a, a long region of linkage. Now, of course, we can draw this box. We couldn't at the time because we didn't have any maps to know what the boundaries of it were. <clears throat> and we all set about trying to close this region. And between 1990 and 1992 and then 1994, the region became smaller and smaller. We, of course, did not know how large it was, but in retrospect, it was almost exactly a megabase because now, of course, we can go to the human genome sequence and identify exactly what the breakpoints are. Then using the approach of positional cloning, which I know that people of my generation and of Frat's generation know all too well, but blessedly our young our young students will never have to do. We cloned out the entire region. There was no sequence yet, so we sequenced all megabase, you know, one base pair at a time. This was hand sequencing. And completely missed BRCA1. And in retrospect, the reason that we completely missed BRCA1 is that BRCA1 is absolutely full <clears throat> of repeats. The, the, the locus, the BRCA1 locus, which is the, the, the locus itself is 84 KB, is 48% ALU. When one carried out positional cloning, one did it by making, by tiling with a combination of yaks developed by Minard Olson and cosmids. Yaks are very large, cosmids are very small, and one could tile. But in order to make these tiles and in order to identify cosmids and yaks that fell on the, in the chromosomal region of interest, one hybridized. And in order to avoid having just complete noise in the system, one blocked the ALU sequences. So if you block the ALU sequences, you are blocking 48% of the BRCA1 region, and you are not picking up any cosmids or yaks that include BRCA1. Of course, we didn't know that. We didn't know this order. All these, all these small bars indicate new genes that we did clone, but, <laughs> but we missed BRCA1. The reason that Myriad Genetics, in particular David Goldgar, and Sasha Kam successfully cloned BRCA1 is that they used BACs. And BACs have the feature that they were longer than cosmids, but smaller than yaks. So they, they spanned the entire BRCA1 region, but they were not chimeric. So Myriad Genetics, or in the person of David, managed to pull out one BAC that turned out to include BRCA1. And when they identified a a portion of the sequence, we knew that in fact we had markers right in the middle of the gene, but we didn't know it. All this that I've just told you is summarized in a little memoir that I was at, right, asked to write at the uh, 20th anniversary of the cloning of the gene in 2014. So if you would like to read uh, two pages uh, in persona as BRCA1, uh, check out that piece in science. So I'm going to show you several pedigrees in order to just give you a flavor of what these families look like um, amongst the ones that we see in the states. BRCA1 and its sister genes, of course, follow a two-hit tumor suppressor model. 
That is, we have one inherited mutation and one somatic, which is to say tissue-specific mutation, which can occur either, either in the breast epithelium, the ovarian epithelium, or as we shall see in the prostate epithelium. And as Broca showed us, this family, an American family from the American Midwest, um, has the feature that breast cancer occurs at a very young age. It can be inherited from mothers or from fathers, which is a bane in our lives because it means, as you shall see, that half the women from a typical family, obviously this one is not typical, half the women who uh, turn out to have mutations aren't aware of it because they inherited the mutation from their father and he was unaffected. Uh, in addition to breast cancer and ovarian cancer, as shown here and here, one sees pancreatic cancer, although blessedly much less frequently. And I shall show you in a moment a family with, um, with severely affected with prostate cancer. Also, just as, as we had predicted in my lab, there are women in this family who develop breast cancer in the absence of a mutation. Here's one, here's one, here's one. Their breast cancers are typical ages. They, aren't, they don't have the younger onset distribution of the, fa of the women who carry the mutation of the family. Also, very occasionally, there is a woman who has reached an elderly age, has not developed breast cancer, and which means, of course, that she has not had that second somatic hit. Um, I, of course, spoke with this lady at length, and she finally got annoyed with me, and she said, don't you think that if I knew what I had done to avoid developing breast cancer, I would have told my daughter. So fair enough. It's stochastic. There are some people who are simply fortunate. Um, this, this pedigree is, is completely uh, biased in the way I have drawn it. There are not more, more daughters than sons in BRCA1 families. I've simply drawn the informative branches on here. There, there, are, there are many men whom I've left off. So young onset, phenocopies, occasional, very occasional unaffected women, and inheritance to fathers half the time. Uh, this is a mutation of particular importance because unlike the vast majority of mutations in BRCA1 and, and its sister genes, which are stops, which are either frame shifts or nonsense mutations or spice mutations leading to stops, this, this mutation is a missense. It's in a domain that has come to be enormously important to our understanding of the biology of BRCA1, namely the E3 ubiquitin ligase ring domain of BRCA1, shown here with two zinc binding motifs, which makes a beautiful heterodimer, uh, worked out by my friend Rachel Clevett upstairs, with BARD1, another E3 ubiquitin ligase, which also has zinc binding motifs. And here is a family from our series, our family three, also an American family. Um, the ancestry going way back is German for this family, ethnic German. And as you see, the mutation, the missense mutation perfectly tracks uh, the breast cancer in the family. The, the ring domain of BRCA1 is, is the only domain that was known prior to the cloning of BRCA1. BRCA1 was cloned completely from first principles using genetics and what we would now call genomics. Um, it, there was no functional knowledge about the gene at all when it was cloned. And, but a ring domain, which is a very small portion at the interminus of BRCA1 and BARD1, had been seen in other genes and has, a, as you see, a zinc binding function. And in the case of this particular ring domain, has an E3 ubiquitin ligase activity importantly directed to the estrogen receptor. And that, that fact ties the, the functions of BRCA1 and its sister genes in complex specifically to these steroid-driven cancers, breast, ovary, and to some extent prostate. It had been a mystery until this was sorted out by, by Rachel Clevett and her group and uh, among, among many others. Um, it had been a mystery why the cancers that are developed in consequence of inherited mutations in, in BRCA1 are bre primarily breast and ovary when the gene is ubiquitously expressed and as we shall see is involved in DNA repair, which obviously is a universal process. The reason is that the interminus of the gene has this, has this uh, critical estrogen repair associated function. We've since, uh, since that uh, first very large family with BRCA1 
one ring finger mutations, we've identified other families with mutations in the BRCA1 or BARD1 ring domains. All three of these families, by happenstance, are Palestinian families, and um, the identification of their mutations is the consequence of the project that Afrat and I are doing with our friend Moeen Kanan in Bethlehem. I want to give BRCA2 perhaps not equal time, but some time. Um, mapping of BRCA1 took me 17 years. The cloning took 15 different competing groups, easily 100 serious experimentalists, four years, with base pair by base pair sequencing, establishing the region as I explained. Mapping BRCA2 took one year, not by me, I was exhausted from the BRCA1 experience, and one year to clone. And the reason was that the Human Genome Project came online at exactly that moment. So I've always thought that we should call BRCA2 John Salston's gene. Um, he decided once BRCA2 was mapped to chromosome 13, he decided to devote the Sanger Center um, sequencing energies to uh, regions on 13. We, he didn't know where, of course, no one did at the beginning, uh, and put that every night he put that information into the public domain. So BRCA2 was cloned very quickly compared to the BRCA1 effort. Nothing as quick as now, of course, but very quickly. I show this family, American family of Dutch ancestry, to show you a really dramatic example of what can be uh, phenotypes that are yielded by mutations in BRCA2. As you see, there are multiple men with breast cancer in this family. These men do not have anything unusual genetically except their BRCA2 mutations. They are not mosaic Klinefelters. They do not have any um, hormonal um, uh, dysfunction at all. All of them are fertile. I haven't indicated all their children. They simply have muta a mutation in BRCA2. Um, this mutation it has its origin in Maastricht. Of course, every mutation in BRCA1 and BRCA2, indeed, in the world has an origin in place and time. This one's Maastricht in the, probably in the 17th century. And I would like to know if, if the Maastricht mutation has, uh, in general, has more breast cancer in men. I, I don't know. The last pedigree I want to show you at this moment is a pedigree from, as you see, a very early family in our series that uh, was a BRCA2 family. Uh, we, I, we worked with it because this uh, this person who had a, a bilateral salpingia leuferectomy is, is a good friend of mine. She's now in her 70s and doing fine and has never developed breast or ovarian cancer. But as you see, the family is chock full of, of breast and indeed pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer in women. But note also the, the number of prostate cancers in men. Here, here young, here, here, here. I had only anecdotes like this from a subset of our families for years, and I was just whistling in the wind about the, the chance that, that BRCA2 in particular would be a prostate cancer gene for years. It did get sorted out, and I'll return to that theme in a bit. I want to show two slides from clinical studies that were done as soon as the genes were cloned that set up the clinical um, paradigm that is now used so widely. Um, a, a group based at Mayo Clinic worked with, with biopsy material that they had going back 30, more than 30 years from women who had had severe family histories of breast cancer, of course did not know any genetics, but had either chosen to have bilateral prophylactic mastectomy or chosen to, to not to. Um, in consequence of their family history. So they were cancer-free when they presented at Mayo Clinic, and then they made this decision on the basis of family history. And by genotyping from the biopsy material, our pathologist friends at Mayo Clinic were able to determine who had mutations and who did not. So everybody on this slide has a mutation, a, a, a damaging mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2, although, of course, she did not know it at the time she made her decision about bilateral mastectomy. And as you see, the amongst the women who chose to have bilateral prophylactic mastectomy, there are some hundred and some of them, there were two, exactly two breast cancers, both in the nipple, because some uh, mastectomy in those days was nipple sparing. And amongst the women who decided not to have bilateral prophylactic mastectomy over 30 years, the risk of breast cancer was extremely high. A somewhat parallel study was done with respect to risk of ovarian fallopian tube, peritoneal, or breast cancer, 
amongst women with mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2 who knew it at the time. So this is a study, this is a prospective study that began as soon as BRCA1 and 2 were both cloned, and the women chose to have or not have salpingo oophorectomy. And amongst the women who chose to have salpingo oophorectomy, as you see, the subsequent experience with breast ovarian cancer, and it is, as you would expect, overwhelmingly with breast cancer, um, is far more favorable than amongst women who chose surveillance. So the consequence of <coughs> those two studies and others like them was a series of recommendations from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network based here in the States but involving people from, uh, from a variety of, of places where this work was carried out. And the recommendations are, and I've written them exactly as, as presented by the network, amongst women who learn they have a mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2, to have an annual mammogram and breast MRI screening beginning at age 25, or even earlier for some of those extremely early onset families, to discuss the option of risk-reducing mastectomy, and then a very strong recommendation, a recommendation for salpingo oophorectomy at age 35 to 40, or upon completion of childbearing, with the understanding that that will, for many women, probably most women, involve short-term hormone replacement therapy, that, that avoiding going into menopause in one's late 30s is, is clearly desirable for, for most women, and that one can titrate the level of hormones that are used until natural menopause would occur without throwing the risk back to what it would be without the esophageal oophorectomy. So clearly it's useful for a woman to know if she carries a mutation in one of these genes. Why was that not a trivial undertaking, beginning with the moment the genes were cloned? There were, there were two challenges, one, shall we say, um, populational or clinical, and one technical. The population-based reason, the family-based reason, is that as I already said, Half, about half of women who have a mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2 have no close, close family history of, bre of breast or ovarian cancer. Here's an example from one of our studies. The, the breast cancer patient was, was sequenced as soon as she developed her breast cancer. She turns out to have a mutation in BRCA1. She and we, at that time, were surprised, but we shouldn't have been surprised. These mutations are inherited from fathers half the time. Her father was the source of her mutation. She has two sisters. Both were, both were fortunate. In the early days after cloning, when sequencing was still very slow and very expensive and there was a, a, a monopoly on it held by Myriad Genetics, learning whether one carried a mutation or not, if one was from anywhere except Israel, basically, was a tremendous challenge. There, were, there are thousands of different mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, there are more than 3,000 different mutations known in BRCA1, more than 4,000 different mutations known in BRCA2. We still, every day in my lab, identify new mutations in, in women who enter our studies from populations that are not already well studied. And BRCA1 and 2 are not the only genes involved. So this was a complete technical obstacle until rapidly parallel sequencing became possible, till next generation sequencing became possible. And I'm very proud of Tom Walsh and my group who as soon as exome sequencing came online in 2009, Tom said, if you can sequence an exome, if you can target an, an exome, you can target breast cancer genes. And he developed the first multi-gene panel for, for, cancer, uh, for cancer sequencing that we named BROCA after guess who? and it yields sequences of all the known and candidate breast cancer genes in a multiplexed format. For a while, we could only use this in research context. Then in 2013, the US Supreme Court unanimously declared that the patenting of genes was not legitimate because genes are a product of nature. And because BROCA was already very widespread in the research context, literally overnight, it became used um, in a very widespread way, um, clinically and commercially. So here's where we stand now. This is all data from either my immediate lab or my lab plus friends, uh, with the proportion of breast, ovarian, and metastatic prostate cancers that are attributable to inherited predisposition in these genes and the rough distribution of genes that are involved. So uh, we
just recently published a, a study of, of breast cancer with very good controls, patients not selected for family history or age of diagnosis. So these are patients from the American population as a whole. Uh, the breast cancer study was about half, about 50% patients of European ancestry, about 50% patients of African-American ancestry, effectively no Ashkenazi Jewish patients. This was a study representative of the, of the U.S. as a whole. And as you see, the, the range of genes involved is very high. About half of women with mutations carried a mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2, a little bit more than half when one includes PALB2. About 6% of all of breast cancer in this population, so general population screen, uh, was due to damaging mutations in one of these three genes or occasionally p53, and about 9% of triple negative breast cancer was due to mutation in one of these genes. The story of ATM and CHECK2 is also interesting. I won't discuss it today, but uh, each of these genes yields a risk of about twofold uh, increased risk for uh, damaging mutations in CHECK2 and about threefold increased risk for damaging loss of function mutations in ATM. For ovarian cancer, 18% of ovarian cancer in an American population based series is attributable to inherited predisposition. Afrat will, of course, talk about the Israeli context in a few minutes. And overwhelmingly, this is BRCA1 and BRCA2. And for metastatic prostate cancer, my my obsession about this was vindicated several years ago when Colin Pritchard, a young, young colleague here at University of Washington, led a study, an international study, that showed that 12% of metastatic prostate cancer, which is to say prostate cancer with scores of, Gleason scores of eight or higher in the, in, the, in the Gleason scoring system, obviously the system has changed now, carried an equally damaging mutation to the best and ovarian mutations in one of these genes. Um, the, the proportion of mutations in BRCA2 is much greater for prostate than it is for ovary or breast. And I think that's probably because of the preference of that ring domain of BRCA1 for estrogen. And uh, 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 clearly there is an involvement also with, um, with other steroids, but it isn't sorted out yet just what that is. Here are some odds ratios for the statisticians among us. What I would like you to, to take home from this slide is that the, the, the relative risk, the odds ratio associated with the mutation in BRCA1 for breast cancer generally, this is not amongst people with a severe family history, is very high. For ovarian cancer, it's very high. Again, general US population, roughly half black, half white. Um, much less representation of Asian women and, and much less representation of Jewish women. BRCA2, the risk, the odds ratios are also very high. PALB2, the risks are also very high, and so on. So these are clearly not casual problems. Right. Let me turn next to the, to the brilliant work that was done to sort out the biology behind BRCA1 and BRCA2 and all of the sister genes whose proteins make a complex, which is collectively responsible for repair of double-strand breaks by the homologous recombination repair pathway. So the homologous recombination repair pathway is by far the most efficient pathway for repairing double-strand breaks. And this is my very, very primitive <laughs> version of how this works. So a break occurs in double-stranded DNA. When we have normal cells, normal healthy cells, it is repaired by a combination of, of or by the RAD51 complex, which includes all our, all our friend genes. The repair takes place as shown here, and we have accurate and stable genomes in consequence. There are alternative pathways. They are much more error prone. They depend on PARP, and they are driven by microhomology. They work, but they involve rearrangements, and they are error prone. In tumors that are BRCA null, either BRCA1 null or BRCA2 null, in consequence of the combination of an inherited hit and a somatic hit, or indeed two somatic mutations in the same gene, when a, a, a mutation occurs, homologous recombination repair is completely abrogated because either BRCA1 or BRCA2 is now completely lost. Its function is completely gone. 
and consequently all the repair is pushed over to this inferior pathway which means that errors occur. At this point, this fact was the source of the, an observation by clinical, by clinical oncologists shortly after the genes were cloned that their ovarian cancer patients who were being treated with cisplatin were, who were BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation carriers were doing better than their patients who did not have mutations in those genes. And in retrospect, it's very likely because mutations in those genes led to loss of homologous recombination repair and allowed those very powerful chemotherapies to completely wipe out the tumor in consequence of exploiting this, this much weaker pathway. The same thinking led to creation of synthetic lethality by inhibiting PARP. So if one inhibits PARP as part of chemotherapy, what one in principle would obtain was double strand break repair, no possibility for homologous recombination repair because, both, because the tumor has lost both copies of its BRCA gene. But then if one inhibits PARP, one no longer has the possibility for even this alternate in joining repair and one has cell death. This model was worked out simultaneously um, in, in Stockholm by Thomas Halliday and in, at the time in London by Alan Ashworth and worked beautifully in cells. It worked beautifully in mice. It did not work at first in a human trial. It turns out that part of the reason was that the drug used did not fully inhibit PARP. And part of the reason was that the patients in the trial were not triaged to have tumors that were BRCA null. Clearly this whole thing is predicated on having a BRCA null ovarian cancer or in principle breast cancer. And indeed resistance forms in a tumor when a mutation occurs that reverses the effect of the original inherited BRCA mutation. And that of course can happen. If one has a two base pair deletion and a, and a subsequent mutation occurs in ovarian epithelium, that is say a mutation of a KB that takes out a KB all around that two base pairs, but it's in frame, one then has a weak but not completely lost capacity for homologous recombination repair and PARP is no longer um, as effective. But it's extremely effective as a first pass drug and once the problems that I indicated about getting a good drug, Olaparib is a good drug, and applying the, the therapy to women who actually can use it effectively, namely with mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2, after primary treatment, these were the results. And this is from the 2018 paper in New England um, that presented those results. The trial needed to be stopped because the women on Olaparib were so much, they had such better survival or time to um, recurrence compared to the women on placebo. Um, our young colleague, Barbara Norquist, says, I never thought when I became a gynecologic oncologist that I would be able to cure women who present to me with stage three ovarian cancer, but increasingly I am. So it's, it's just been fabulous. It's now used for breast and increasingly for prostate as well. Um, there was concern, of course, that some of the side effects of taking a, such a, a potent inhibitor might cause cardiac problems. There is overall a 70% reduction in cancer progression and also in death from all causes, as shown quite recently by Steve Narod and his colleagues. Uh, do I have a few more minutes or should I stop now? It, it, turn, turn your, unmute yourself, Aura. One or two more minutes. Okay, good. Then I will tell you some technologies that we love that we're just developing now to tackle this problem. There are, despite everything I've said and despite the fact that it's very effective and we can, can save the lives of many women by empowering them by, with their genetic information, there are still many severely affected families that have no mutations after testing with BRCA. And BRCA is a good approach. It, te it co collects all classes of genes, or all classes of mutations in those genes, except for a few. So here are some examples of families that we could not solve, but here are some tricks that we're using to solve them. Here, for example, 
using whole genome sequencing. This is short read whole genome sequencing. We identified in one patient, one of, our Pal one of the patients from our Palestinian project, a 29 KB deletion that takes out the BRCA1 promoter, here it is, the promoter, and exons 1, 2, and 3 of BRCA1, which ends up deleting uh, amino acids 1 through 45, which includes much of that ring domain. And we can, we can detect that, that large deletion very straightforwardly with short read whole genome sequencing by using a combination of split reads and read depth. Um, since it went off the end of BROCA, uh, we weren't sure of it from BROCA. We thought we, we thought we had a clue, but we weren't absolutely sure. Uh, this Palestinian patient was diagnosed with breast cancer at age 41 and her mother with breast cancer at age 50. We don't have pathology on, on this patient, but her mother died of her breast cancer very shortly thereafter, so chances are it was, it was a, 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 a severe stage. Here's another example with a very large deletion Again, short read whole genome sequencing, a 240 KB deletion of BRCA1 and five other genes, which shows you how non-essential the genes in the neighborhood of BRCA1 are. And again, this one was trickier because it's such a large deletion. Here's what a, a typical person looks like with respect to read depth along this region of, of about 300 KB total. And you can see, of course, read depth does differ because there's a lot of seg dupes in the region, but our patient Again, based on read depth and based on split reads, which enabled us to detect the breakpoints, um, has this large deletion. This patient is one of our patients here in Seattle. She's of Mexican ancestry. She had triple negative breast cancer diagnosed at age 35. Um, Sylvia Cassidy in the lab developed some um, diagnostic primers that would enable this deletion to be picked up very easily and clinically without having to do whole genome sequencing. And it turns out to be a founder mutation for triple negative breast cancer amongst women of Mexican ancestry. So it's very useful and it's been integrated into clinical testing in that population. And finally, my pride and joy. So we've developed, we, by we I mean Tom, uh, Tom Walsh, has developed um, an approach called Smart Catch, which exploits CASPER-based excision of roughly 200 KB regions around all of the genes that we care about. So BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2, and so on. Um, and then long read sequencing, but multiplexed long read sequencing so that one can afford to do it, um, of, those, of those captured regions. And here is one example of what that combination of of CRISPR-driven capture plus long read sequencing, multiple long read sequencing can yield. So this is a family with breast cancer in three generations, obviously early onset. If the family is uh, American, Romanian ancestry, and completely negative by BRCA sequencing, it turns out that they have an insertion of a combination of, it's an SVA, of an ALU with a VNTR and a sign element that comes from chromosome one. And this retrotransposon is inserted into intron 13 of BRCA1. Here's its Sanger sequence to prove that it's real. Here's the cDNA sequence that shows us that here's the insertion and that it, it spits out two different pseudo exons, both of which include a stop. And the reason that this was missed by BROCA and missed by short read sequencing is that BROCA wasn't tiled to pick up anything on chromosome one. And short read sequencing, which of course would pick up sequence on chromosome one, uh, when aligned, aligned it to chromosome one. And there were no reads that were long enough to span the entire sequence, which is, as you see, um, I think it's about two and a half KB. So one needs to have, here it is, yeah, 2.8 KB. One needs to have long enough reads to transcend, to span inserts of this sort in order to be able to detect them. And <clears throat> we're now um, working with Afrat to see if some of her mystery families also have this sort of insertion. So. We're devoting a lot of our time now to developing, uh, or ex I should say, exploiting new technologies, adding new tricks to them in order to make them uh, useful for detecting mutations that have heretofore 
uh, been cryptic. And a very large number of very severely affected breast cancer families have this feature. So my final slide. What have I said to now uh, segue to Afrat's presentation? What are the themes that transcend all three of these cancers? The mutations are individually rare. There are thousands of them, but collectively they are quite common. Development of cancer requires inherited plus somatic mutation in the same gene, that is two hits. The critical genes when mutant lead to loss of DNA repair. Many genes can cause inherited breast cancer, but each patient has an inherited mutation in only one gene, with very rare exception of patients who have mutations in two genes. But this is not a polygenic story. This is a story of, of major genes. And so I haven't discussed this, but purely somatic events, genomic or epigenetic, in the same genes have the same effect as inherited mutations. What matters is loss of function of the gene. So here are the folks from my group who've carried out the work that I have discussed, and I will stop sharing my slide, and we will return, I suspect, to Aura. Thank you all very <laughs> Thank, much. Thank you very much, Mary Claire. Um, we are running a little bit late because we started a little bit late, but I would never stop Mary Claire because it was absolutely fascinating, and you took us from the ben bedside to the bench, to the bedside again, back to the bench, showed us pitfalls of NGS, which is amazing, and then ways to overcome that. So um, we don't have time for questions right now, but please write them in the chat and hopefully we'll be able to come back to you. And I would like to um, present our next speaker, who is Professor Efrat Levi Lahad. Efrat is the director of the Medical Genetics Institute at Shari Tzedek Medical Center in Jerusalem and professor of medicine and medical genetics at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She's also the vice president of our academy, the Israel National Academy for Science and Medicine. She heads this uh, genetic in, uh, institute, which, is, which offers a complete range of services, genetic services, including a pre gestational uh, testing. And she has done extensive research on population genetics of inherited breast and ovarian cancer and on gene discovery and rare diseases. And I suspect that from the bench to the bedside, if Fred will take us to the community and to the population. So we will really have a very wide look and broad look at um, the implication of these gene discoveries. If Fred, you're muted right now, so please unmute. So thank you, Ora, for the kind introduction. I don't know how I ever agreed to speak directly after Mary Claire. That's, that was a totally <laughs> dangerous thing to do. <laughs> Uh, I can't think of a more hard act to follow. So I'm going to, but I'm going to do my best and I'm going to really talk about, um, you were right, Aura, I'm going to talk about taking this to the level of the population. Um, so just a second. So I'm hoping you can see my slides. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about a, um, a slightly different evolution, and it and I, I was just thinking about it that it's taken 25 years, which is really too long, and hopefully uh, this kind of timing for of trans translating genomic and genetic discoveries into action can be a little faster. So originally, as Mary Claire showed, um, you know, testing was done in high risk families. The idea was to identify women in those very high risk families who were in fact at risk. And the next stage was really um, testing patients that had specific cancers, uh, in, in this context, breast or ovarian cancer. And the idea here is to prevent a second malignancy in these women. And also increasingly, as Mary Claire showed with um, certain chemotherapies like cisplatinum and certainly PARP inhibitors, with the, the fact that there are therapeutic implications was a game changer that led to much more widespread testing of people that already had cancer. Um, so BRCA1 and BRCA2 were cloned in the mid 90s. And immediately after that, it became apparent that Ashkenazi Jews or Jews of European origin have particularly uh, common mutations in these genes and essentially three specific mutations, which you see here occur in about one in 40 Ashkenazi Jews. Other mutations are very rare in Ashkenazi Jews. And what this meant was that even very early on in the um, late 90s, early 2000s, uh, in Israel, in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, we could perform very large scale studies uh, 
when actually sequencing entire genes in thousands of people was not possible, testing specific mutations in thousands of people was possible. And, uh, and among other reasons, this is one of the, um, I would say the reasons that um, population genetics has been largely performed uh, in Ashkenazi Jews in this context. And studies from Mary Claire in our lab and for ovarian cancer from Baruch Modan and Aitan Friedman showed that in Ashkenazi Jews, about 11% of all breast cancer cases and, and a whopping 40% of ovarian cancer cases are the result of these mutations. And just to give you, you know, comparison, in Caucasians, we're talking, or in mixed populations, it's six to eight percent of all breast cancer and 15 to 20 percent of all ovarian cancer. Um, I'm a physician, and this is an example of what happens when you test a woman with ovarian cancer. So this is a 49-year-old woman. She uh, it has ovarian cancer. Quite early on, we started testing all women with ovarian cancer, and she's found to be a carrier of one of the three common Ashkenazi mutations. In this case, 5382 insert C. Now, if you look at the family pedigree, it looks like there is there are two possibilities. Either there's, I mean, there's very little cancer history, which can suggest that maybe cancer risk is actually low for uh, people with, or there are people who have the mutations and never develop cancer. But it turns out um, not to be the case, as I'll show later. But the other thing that's more disturbing is. Uh, Mary Claire talked about risk reduction salpingoophorectomy, that is having your ovaries removed. And you look at this 49-year-old woman who essentially is getting a very severe diagnosis. The five-year survival for ovarian cancer is still quite low. And this could have easily been prevented had she known that she was a carrier. And if we, we want to think about using this information of, about breast and ovarian cancer genetics for prevention, what it really means is that we need to identify these women before they ever become affected. And if we test them only afterwards, really that's um, one woman too late. And uh, that got me and others obviously thinking about uh, population screening already a while ago. And the question was, how should we go about it? And um, in the 1960s, Wilson and Jungner published their principles and practice for screening of disease that still hold to this very day. And you can see here the list of a criteria. So the disease should be important. I think we can agree that breast and ovarian cancer are important diseases. There must be a latent or early symptomatic stage, in this case, being an asymptomatic carrier. The natural history of the disease should be well understood. Well, that was really a gap because all of the information came from high-risk families originally. And we didn't really know whether if we identify carriers at the population level, whether they would be at such high risks. There has to be a suitable test or examination. So for Ashkenazi Jews, that, that was easy, just testing for the three common mutations. The test should be acceptable to the population. That was another gap. We don't know if women would be interested in um, having such a test outside the disease context. There should be treatment, in this case, uh, risk reduction salpingoophorectomy and also risk reduction mastectomy. There should be screening of the groups, facilities for diagnosis, an agreed policy on whom to treat, at least in countries with socialized medicine like Israel, uh, the screening and facilities do exist. And then obviously there has to be some kind um, of cost benefit analysis. So if you look at items three, five, and 10, we really identified those as being gaps in knowledge that we wanted to address in order to think about population screening for prevention. So the first study we did was looking at the natural history of, of the BRCA1 and 2 mutations in Ashkenazi Jews at the population level. And the way we did it at the population level was really testing men that had no personal family history of cancer and that weren't selected on family history. And we tested them for these mutations. And we ended up recruiting over um, 8,000 men. We found that 2.2% were carriers, which is about what we would expect. And then we went into their families and we first asked, well, do carrier, do carrier families that were identified through healthy men, do they have significant family history? And we compared them to age match and residence match controls. So if you look at the controls, um, about 90% of them do not have family history. And that's about what we would expect because we generally say that about 10% of people do have a family, his significant family history um, of cancer. But what about carriers? So that was a bit of a surprise. If you look at the carriers, only 15% of them had very significant family history of breast and ovarian cancer. So how does this come about? And, uh, and as you can see here, almost 63% didn't have any um, 
or very little family history of breast and ovarian cancer. So when, does this mean that there is low risk? I'll give you the answer already. The answer is no. And the way we found out that we found that out was we actually looked at the female relatives um, in these families. Um, we ended up with 259 non-carriers and 211 BRCA1 and BRCA2 carriers. And we found out that in fact, 44% of them had already been affected with either breast and ovarian cancer. And if we look at this more formally, the combined risk for, for these women who were identified through healthy men and were carriers uh, was very high. It was uh, on the order of about 80% for lifetime risk for either breast or ovarian cancer. So how do we explain the, this seeming contradiction that the risk for carriers is very high, but 60% don't have a family history? And one reason is the lack of information um, once we got into the families, you know, some, um, every geneticist has had this experience. You have a couple coming in and you ask the man about a family history of, uh, of, of cancers or even other diseases in the family. He says, oh, we have nothing. And then the wife starts doing the, the, her husband's family history and suddenly everything uh, um, comes up. So women are the agents of, uh, of, um, of health history in their families. So about 15% of these families actually shifted to having um, a significant family's history. But in the other 50%, what's really happening is small families or multiple males or what we call Mendelian luck, meaning that most, on average, half of relatives are going to be carriers. But if it's mostly men, you're not going to see a lot of breast and ovarian cancer. So just to give the example of the pedigree I showed earlier, this woman who was a carrier, in fact, inherited the mutation from her father. So you could say, well, look, there's so many women in this, in her maternal grandmother's family, maybe it's, you know, maybe they're all the, these carriers who are at low risk for cancer. But this 93 year old grandmother was still alive. So we could test her and we found out that she was not a carrier. So in fact, these are all women are all healthy because simply their the mutation does not exist in their family. And when you look at the father's family, you see that this is a, obviously the mutation came from his dad. And this is a family with multiple males and very few um, offspring. So obviously this woman was at very high risk, but she had no family history because it all came from a paternal lineage with many males in the family. So looking at our uh, list of, uh, of principles for screening, we felt that we uh, showed that the natural history is such that carriers at the population level have a very high risk. What about the test being acceptable to the population? So really, if you think about doing population screening for genetics, it's a totally, it's a different beast. Uh, the traditional model is a person has cancer or has a family history of cancer and they go for genetic um, um, counseling. And if a mutation is identified, we perform cascade testing. That is, we test other relatives in the family. If we're looking at population screening, it's, it's not, the context is not a disease. It means everybody above a certain age, let's say, gets tested and there's no specific disease context. So we wondered how that would, uh, how that would work out in real life. And the study with, that we designed where, was where we offered testing to Ashkenazi women. They were either enrolled by recruiters at places like mammography clinics, outpatient clinics, uh, phys family physician offices, or they were self-referred by you know, word of mouth, um, brochures and posters in the hospital. And the pretest process did not include genetic counseling. We limited it to written information. There was a family history questionnaire. Um, they could contact the genetic counselor if they wanted to, but very few did. Um, testing was performed for the three founder mutations. And then th 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 there was one of three outcomes. If they were non-carriers without a significant family history, they only got a summary letter by mail. If they were non-carriers, but did have a significant family history, they were invited for, for in-person genetic counseling with recommendations. And obviously, if they were carriers, they were also invited for in-person um, genetic counseling. And what we found in this study, first is that people were interested in getting tested. The uptake was 67% in the recruiter enrolled arm where we could see how many were interested and how many not. There was very high compliance with post-test genetic counseling. One of the concerns was, OK, we'll give this written information, we'll do this test, and then the women are not going to follow up. But in fact, all of the carriers did follow up. And in the high risk non-carriers, that is women who were not carriers, but did have a significant family history, 87% um, came back for genetic counseling. 
there were some men in the study, so the rate was even higher in women. And we did a lot of uh, sort of psychological testing, uh, knowledge panels, impact of event scale, and we found um, satisfaction with health decision scales. And we found that even with written information only, there was high satisfaction, there was moderate knowledge and a moderate sense of control, and there was minimal psychological harm. One really interesting outcome of these studies that actually came out only in uh, in-depth interviews with participants was the idea of stepwise knowledge. I know that the um, gold standard of genetic counseling is you sit with a patient and you give them all the information in the world um, before they make the decision. But what actually many of our participants expressed is they said, well, you know, there's only so much information that you need to make the decision. And after that, you sort of listen to this information and it's irrelevant to you um, unless you are yourself a carrier or you have family history. And they actually preferred um, getting limited information at the pretest stage, but sort of moving the bulk of information to the post-test stage where you already discuss the results and uh, sorry, discuss recommendations in the context of um, uh, results of the genetic test. And obviously carriers uh, need um, continued support. If you want to think about the two ways we recruited people into the study, so one, one way was kind of more of a medical model where you're being recruited. So it, it means, for example, your physician is referring you. And by the way, the, the best ref referrals are apparently gynecologists. Women do what their gynecologist tells them um, to do more than other medical professions. That was interesting. Um, but there was also this open access arm where if it's just you heard about it, there was a poster word of mouth. And we found that they attracted different groups. So we think there is room for both ways of, um, of, reaching, uh, of, of reaching people. Uh, we did find that participants are much older than we would like. If we're going to reap the benefits of prevention, you really want to get women in their late 20s, early 30s, whereas participants in this trial uh, tended to be in their fifth, in around age 50, which is a little late. But obviously, screening can overcome a lot of testing barriers. First, there's that biological barrier that 50% of carriers have no family history. But um, there are also many stories about the issues of family cooperation, family communication. People are uh, hesitant to speak to relatives about this. Sometimes they've hidden the fact that they have a cancer diagnosis. So there are a lot of barriers within, um, within families. And obviously in any system, there are a lot of referral and bureaucratic barriers um, that, you know, to get tested, whether it, whereas if it's a screening program, that can all be, um, that can all be simplified significantly. So we found out that the test was acceptable to the population, at least in this research context. I want to talk a little just for one minute about the issue of satisfactory treatment, um, which is really uh, still focused mainly on risk reduction surgeries. Uh, we still don't have drugs to offer us uh, prevention for these cancers. Uh, possibly tamoxifen, raloxifen for breast cancer in carriers, but that's a controversial subject, so I'm not going to get into it. But I would say the mainstay of our recommendations for carriers are these risk reduction surgeries. So in terms of risk reduction uh, salpingoophorectomy, um, I would say in Israel, probably about 80 to 90% of carriers have them uh, by age 40. But risk reduction mastectomy is much less popular in Israel. The vast majority of carriers choose to have breast preservation and surveillance. Um, this is a study from uh, Eitan Friedman's group that about 13% um, of Israeli carriers have risk reduction uh, mastectomy. There's been a recent um, overview of this by uh, Metcalf, um, who looked at, who did an international survey on this. And you can see that this is very variable across countries, but even in the United States, which, which is the country with the highest rates of risk reduction mastectomies in carriers, we're talking about about 50% of carriers. That means 50% of carriers do not, do not have risk-reducing risk mastectomy. And the question we asked was, how, is, how does surveillance uh, um, perform? And this will all obviously re require long-term prospective studies, but we tried to look at this retrospectively by asking ourselves, okay, if you're a woman who's a carrier and you did not have your breast removed, you're obviously at greater risk for, for breast cancer, uh, you know you're a carrier, you're gonna have greater surveillance. It's not going to prevent your cancer, but it could in principle lead to earlier stage of diagnosis. Whereas 
you might only find out you're a carrier after you've developed your breast cancer. So we looked at the BRCA1 and BRCA2 carriers who were diagnosed with, uh, with breast cancer at Charit Tzedek, and we looked at those who were identified after, well, who were identified uh, with breast cancer, but they had already known that they were carriers. So this is the pre-diagnostic group, and we compared them to those carriers who found out they were carriers only after their breast cancer diagnosis. And what we found out was that those who were identified as carriers before they ever had breast cancer had lower rates of invasive breast cancer, had downstaging a diagnosis, less use of axillary dissection, less use of chemotherapy. Um, and they did have more bilateral mastectomies, but that's because they were already primed and they knew that they were carriers ahead of time. Um, and, and most amazingly, the pre-symptomatic knowledge of carrier status was associated with a significantly improved five-year overall survival, um, which you can see here. And I think that just shows that even in, in, in Israel, where we have low rates of uh, risk reduction mastectomies, there is a, a survival benefit uh, for these women who know their carriers before they are ever diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, and um, so the last, the last uh, gap standing is, uh, is a cost-benefit analysis. I'm not going to discuss that now, but just to say that there are data, especially from Enchanta's group in London, but also we've done this analysis for Israel and we're writing it up, um, that it's actually cost saving, not just uh, cost effective um, to do population screening for BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. And um, what's been very gratifying is that as, as a result of all this work in January of 2020, BRCA screening was included in the list of health services um, um, in Israel. Uh, the way the Israeli Health Service works is that all Israeli permanent residents are insured. It's, it's uh, funded through an income-based health tax. The services are provided through four HMOs, but there is actually a list of the mandatory health services um, um, regulated by the Ministry of Health, and it's updated annually by a public committee, and the HMOs are required to provide at least the li listed um, services. So this was supposed to start in January of 2020. We all know that uh, what happened in January 2020 was Corona. So this hasn't really taken off the ground yet, but it is beginning um, in, in the last, I would say, month or two. Um, it's meant for women age 30 or older um, as that, that have not had breast or ovarian cancer themselves, but it's not predicated on family history. Any Ashkenazi ancestry doesn't have to be full. And the test is, um, in principle, the three founder mutations, although many of the HMOs are actually testing a, uh, a group of mutations that have been seen uh, recurrently in the uh, Jewish, in the Jewish, also non-Ashkenazi population. The women don't receive any pretest counseling. If the results are negative, they get a letter. They're recommended to go for genetic counseling if there is a family history. Obviously, if they're found out to be a carrier, they're, um, they're routed to the um, carrier uh, surveillance and screening program. So just to summarize, you know, we think that population screening for BRCA1 and BRCA2 founder mutations fulfills population screening criteria, certainly in populations with founder mutations. I will say that there are many founder mutations worldwide, not just in the Ashkenazi Jewish populations, and certainly, th these can be used as paradigms for uh, implementation research. The cost of sequencing has gone down so much that probably full sequencing and maybe even adding an, adding additional genes is uh, is technically at least or financially feasible. But that raises other questions. For example, what to do with variants of unknown significance? Personally, I feel that you know screening is never meant to detect 100%. And, and if you're looking at the screening context, I think it's fair to say that the US's are simply not returned, but obviously these are issues that require um, more discussion. But I think it's an exciting, can be an exciting time of using genomics for precision prevention. We talk so much about precision therapy, but really, you know, every carrier who develops ovarian cancer means we did something wrong along the way. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm gratified that Barb can, Norquist can cure women with ovarian cancer, but many of them should not have gotten it in the, um, in the first place. Um, and there are many, many collaborators, some of, many of whom are here, 
um, especially um, we've, we've had a long-term collaboration with the Sheba Medical Center, now originally with Bella, who I'll talk about in a second, and now with Renat, and obviously with Mary Claire groups, Mary Claire's group um, in Seattle. And Mary Claire and I would like to dedicate this web webinar to our good friend and colleague, uh, Professor Bella Kaufman. I'm going to try not to not to cry. She died um, two and a half uh, weeks ago of the very disease that she devoted her life to treating. And if anybody is interested in hearing her courageous and unbelievable talk about being both an oncologist and a patient, it was the European School of Oncology keynote lecture um, in 2017. You can find it um, on YouTube. And uh, Bella was uh, really an inspiration to me and to many other uh, physicians. She always used to say, oh, I'm not a scientist, but it's really not true. And, in, and especially in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 arena, Mary Claire alluded to the fact that PARP inhibitors were almost not developed uh, because the company stock at the market was, was small and they weren't sure um, how effective they would be. And uh, Bella, she said that she was strengthened by a couple of glasses of wine, which was two glasses of wine above her usual intake. Um, but uh, the, she got her courage up and spoke to an AstraZeneca uh, deputy president and got him to do uh, one of the first, I would say, basket trials where we're looking at carriers that had different types of cancer. It was originally known actually as the Israeli study and the success of that study actually pushed the whole PARP inhibitor field ahead. And like I said, speaking about Bella in the past tense is horrible and uh, she is sorely missed. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Efrat and uh, Mary Claire. We have a few minutes uh, for questions. I noted that there was one question on the chat. So if you two would like to um, continue that conversation, Rakefet. Are, are you thinking about the question? I, I, my chat doesn't go far enough up for me to now remember who. Oh, yes. Okay, Rakefet, are you still Rakefet. here? Right. So Rakefet asks, um, what about the missing heritability? How much will eventually turn out to be due to polygenic SNPs, high-risk rare alleles? And I wrote back that we undertook this study, published it in JAMA Oncology a few years ago, um, specifically in Ashkenazi Jewish patients based in the States. Um, and let me tell you what we found. Um, first, so there's a number of bits to this story. First, with respect to BRCA1 and BRCA2, as, as Afrat said, there are some rare alleles. In our context, without exception, those rare alleles were found in non-Jewish um, lineages of these American patients. So as of course everyone knows, many uh, American Jews have ancestry, have European ancestry that is not Jewish. And I believe we found four mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2 that were simply European mutations that had entered these, these extended families a number of generations ago. Um, <clears throat> the most important um, factor in explaining the the familial clustering, the missing the missing heritability, was mutations in Chek2, uh, both Chek2 1100 del C, again pan European, and the Jewish allele um, S428 F, which Afrat can speak to in in greater detail. Um, both those mutations increase risk two to three fold. Uh, if one incorporated those, muta uh, those check two mutations and the rare European, B well, they're not rare in Europe, but the rare in Ashkenazim, the, and the European BRCA1 and 2 mutations, we had no remaining familial clustering in our New York breast cancer study population of just over a thousand families, no remaining familial clustering beyond what one would expect by chance. There is a factor here that I think one needs to be explicit about, and that is that that the that the cancer risk uh, 
associated with carrying a mutation in one of these genes has increased over time. And that's not because the genes have suddenly become more aggressive, obviously. It's because the non-genetic risk factors for breast cancer have a greater prevalence. So if one is working with colleagues from, from a place where it appears that uh, women with mutations in these genes do not develop breast cancer, one needs to ask the question, uh, is it simply that they will be much later onset, given a background in which breast cancer is much rarer. That is, we have uh, girls with much later menarche, much earlier first pregnancies, and so on. With respect to the question of polygenic risk scores, let me address that also, because we've also thought about that. I'll leave to a frat talking about polygenic risk scores in the Ashkenazim in Israel. In, in, in our studies, both amongst the Ashkenazim and in American families generally, well, let me speak to American families generally. If I do the same thing with our series of several thousand families, various ancestries, but exclude the Jewish families, um, that has been done in the case control studies, I see superficially the same thing. That is, I see that probands of those families have higher polygenic risk scores than controls, women without breast cancer to whom they are not related. However, if I look within a family and I ask the question, do the women in these families, and none of these families have BRCA1 or 2 mutations, within the family, do I see a difference in the polygenic risk scores of the women who become affected versus the women who don't? The answer is no. There's no difference at all. It's just, it's absolutely null, totally null. It's not a matter of power, it's totally null. What kind of a metric has those features? A metric has those features if it is correlated with, but not biologically causal of the phenotype. So I think the people who've been doing these studies in Europe and America are effectively identifying um, a, a series of benign alleles that are highly correlated with social class within race. Incidentally, none of this transfers from one race to another. You cannot apply the same polygenic risk scores to African Americans and get anything at all, um, let alone Africans. So um, it's it's correlative, but it's not causative, at least based on our, our series of several thousand families of, of, of mixed, very mixed um, ancestries. And so I think that, I honestly believe that we have, for the Ashkenazim specifically, not for other Israeli populations, but specifically for the Ashkenazim, I think that we have explained inherited breast cancer with, as Efrat says, a greater than 95% specificity for the three ancient alleles and a, a substantial contribution from the two check two alleles. Efrat? I think, uh, I mean, I, I think the, the issue with polygenic risk scores is that there's a difference between risk prediction and biology. You might find something that gives you good risk prediction within very defined parameters. So the fact that the, the polygenic risk scores have generally not been portable uh, between ethnic groups suggests that you really have to be very careful. Um, you want to make sure that the patient you're going to think about using it in has to be from exactly that background. And we know that there's a lot of hidden stratification um, even, even in this, the, these studies. And um, all I can say is, uh, I won't give names away, but I was uh, concerned about, um, you know, we use, um, we use the risk prediction tools in the clinic to uh, assess risk in patients just based on their family history and panel testing, let's say if they've had a negative result. Um, and um, one of the new tools uh, uses also polygenic risk scores. And I actually contacted the group that does them and I, you know, to ask about it, and it turns out even they don't use them clinically. So, you know, I th and the other, I would say, disappointing um, piece that's also been true of GWAS studies is that only very rarely has it yielded actual genes that explain any part of the, um, of the phenotype. So I'm not saying that they're not necessarily predictive of risk, maybe they are, but I think it has to be so calibrated to the actual um, ethnic background, and it's still unclear. Um, you know, there's sort of no—I um, would say there's no firm ground there in terms of saying, well, this is 
the biology, this is the actual gene that's driving um, a particular SNP. And so I, 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 fi I find that still very, um, uh, very precarious. That's the way, uh, um, that's the way I would put it. But you know, I could be just an old fashioned geneticist. I like seeing mutations <laughs> in actual genes. Maybe that's passe. So. I was referring mainly to the uh, Eric Lander work on the polygenic background that modifies uh, familial hypercholesterolemia and Lynch syndrome and uh, the breast cancer. And it, 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 threw, it threw me off the uh, amazing variation and the uh, hundreds of thousands from the biobanks that they. Yeah, it's it, it, there's, it's hard there's to, a tremendous uh, amount of. Right, there's a tremendous amount of population stratification in those big biobanks that's not accounted for by people saying, yes, I'm British or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, and, and, I, and they are they are demonstrably, I mean, we've shown this, they are demonstrably picking up very subtle differences. But when you, but when you have hundreds of thousands of people, a subtle difference has a huge chi-square. And there are subtle differences in ancestry, not subtle differences in disease risk. I, I would honestly stay away from it for anything that matters. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions that weren't in the chat? There's a question about the ethics of clinical trials on prophylactic surgeries. Maybe Efrat, you could address that. Um, so, okay, so um, the, I, I think the main Obviously, these um, th there is, as far as I know, one randomized uh, trial for um, in in the Netherlands for uh, salping for early salpingectomy. So this is based on the idea that uh, the source of ovarian cancer is in fact the fallopian tubes, and if you want to delay oophorectomy, then one way of doing it is to do a salpingectomy before you do an oophorectomy. That way the ovaries stay intact and maybe you're taking out the tissue that's going to, um, uh, where, where the ovarian cancer is going to originate. Um, you know, I, I, think is, I, I think the hypothesis is reasonable. And I think if people understand, um, you know, if you make sure that they understand what they're, what they're participating in, I don't think, um, I, I mean, I, I think that's, uh, that's perfectly ethical. I think it, uh, to me, sort of the question is, is, is almost the opposite. We're so used to surgery never being being actually tested by, by any kind of, of formal trial, right? It's just a surgeon decides on a new technique and they except go for and- prof Except for radical mastectomy versus modified versus simple mastectomy, which- Right, no, but I'm saying, but that's- We're except, brave enough to do that trial. Exactly, and that's what I'm saying, but that's sort of, the, it was the, I would say almost the exception um, you know, to the rules. So I, I, I so I, I mean, I think it's it, it's much better to do this within a trial context than uh, you know than situations like oh well, let's just take your you know your your fallopian tubes and and then do it later. But so you would, I, you would not go beyond uh, delaying an ophorectomy. Not at this point, but I but I. If it were, I, I will say that study is ongoing. If they prove that in fact salpingectomy um, uh, prevents ovarian cancer, then sure, absolutely. I, I believe Liz Swisher would also say that the situation is quite different for BRCA1 carriers and for BRCA2 carriers. Mm -hmm. I have a maybe provocative question for Mary Claire. Um, I noted in a comment in uh, Nature July 19, 2019, that uh, Colin Pritchard suggested that uh, BRCA1 not be called BRCA1, but rather the King syndrome. And um, all modesty aside, um, both of you talked about increasing awareness as a way of saving lives. So that if women know their status there or are there either less likely to be sick, or if they get sick, they're more likely to survive. So do you think that having a nickname for this syndrome, um, named after you or somebody else or something else, would increase awareness, would make this, um, would, would make this um, more somehow accessible to the general population and, and promote saving lives? 
it's an interesting idea that a nickname might might work. I think we should call it the Bella's, Bella's syndrome because she she played more roles in this than any one of us. She was she was a scientist, she was a clinician, she was an advocate, and she was a patient, uh, and she was a mutation carrier. The uh, it maybe can help as you might imagine that editorial was a was a a, a sort of a, a local a local surprise that they then walked in and showed me this editorial in Nature, and I thought, oh no, what next? <laughs> so, <laughs> it, if it helps, I'm all for a nickname. Efrat, what do you think? Um, I, 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 I would say I'm emotionally in favor of calling it King Syndrome, but I'm not sure. Um, I actually, I think that I think the issue of awareness. There, there was a blip in awareness with Angelina Jolie a couple of years ago. People might remember, um, but it's not. It's not enough, and I. Uh, I, I'm hoping that at least in Israel, if there is finally a real population screening campaign, that there will be more awareness. But I think it's just, I actually think it's a difficult, um, it's a difficult sell. People don't, you know, people don't really want to think about cancer in the first place. And then, um, you know, and then if they, if there is cancer, then what we're really offering is all these, you know, surgeries. So, you know, I think we. I think the hurdles are are, uh, are are not are not insignificant. But I will say that when I when I think about when I started out, when I um, I came back from my fellowship uh, after raiding Mary Claire's lab in 1996, and I opened the cancer genetics clinic, and people physicians told me that I'm 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 doing a um, I'm trying to think of the of the of the right phrase that I was basically doing a foolish thing, that I was uh, um, you know I was just going to be worrying and alarming people for you know for no good reason, and there isn't really any um, uh, you know there there isn't really any reason to have such a clinic or to have such a service. It's and so I think that viewpoint is kind of at least gone away but I, I think I think um, I think there's hard work uh, ahead of us in terms of uh, in terms of awareness uh, and acceptance but of course the fraud have you had incidence of ovarian cancer decrease yet among the Ashkenazim in Israel I don't know I have to look at the Israel cancer you Register. Look. three years behind <laughs> so, but I can try it's, right. it's been 25 years I mean my guess is that that will soon start to happen that that may well be. And that would be amazing, obviously. That would be fantastic. I mean, watching a cancer go away would be a very cool thing. And I'm trying to see if we have any oncologists here, but uh, maybe they would know. Just to tell you something about names in Israel, Lynch syndrome has a terrible connotation. I took exactly. A it does here too. Doctor, <laughs> so at least with your name, <laughs> that's <laughs> good. It's more of a nine. It's loyal. Yep. <laughs> right. I would say I would settle for I would settle for an MCK documentary, like the RBG documentary. <laughs> so how about that? <laughs> Fine. The story that of fun. yeah of the story of MCK, including you know all the wonderful achievements. Very nice. Very I agree. Nice. So on that uplifting note, I'd like to thank both of our speakers very very much. I think whoever participated in this webinar gained tremendously from it. It was really enlightening and so fluent and so full of your passion uh, for this subject over the years. And of course, your beautiful friendship. And I don't know if you know, I, you said you don't know Hebrew, Mary Claire, but I don't know if you know the word firgun. Do you know that word? No. It, 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 it's the opposite of schadenfreude. Oh, okay. Then, then I know what it is. It's thinking and, and feeling good things about people. Right. You don't even really, you don't have a Hebrew equivalent of Schadenfreude, I'll bet. No. So we can really well that we there is actually. But anyway, <laughs> you can feel your fear goon for Efrat and vice versa, and it's paid off in tremendous science and tremendous uh, accomplishments. And thank you very very much for this thank wonderful. Thank you. It's been a, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Rivka, do you want to thank add you. something? Thank you. Well, you've, you've said it all. Thank you so much, Marie-Claire. Thank you so much, Efrat. That was wonderful. 
Uh, what, what a great end of the week. Thank you and have a wonderful weekend, all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.